Hello everyone, so good to have you back at House of Refuge Church, Pastor James Jeffries, and we're going to talk about walking in the Spirit, because it equals life. Walking in the Spirit equals life. Now what do I mean by that, and what does the Scriptures have to say about it? We're just going to go into the Scriptures and take a look at some things. Here in Galatians 5, 16 through 26, it says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish now I want you to notice that in the scriptures this word spirit is capitalized that means it's talking about the Holy Spirit for the flesh lust against the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come into our lives to guide us into all truth, teach us about who Jesus is. But our flesh is, is lusting against it. In other words, it wants the things of the Spirit. We lust for the blessings, the rest, the peace, the miracles, the signs, the wonders. We lust for that. The flesh wants all of that stuff but we don't want to listen and obey and follow the Spirit and live a holy life in this world. You know, we want to continue to do carnal, fleshly things, but we still want the blessings of the Spirit. So let's understand that this morning. But if you are led by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, he's talking about the law of Moses. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's talking about, you know, you're just involved. You, all of that's operating in your life. Maybe not every one of these things, but some things. Some people, you know, are still drunkards. And it's saying drunkards will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Not saying that a person who drinks a drink won't enter. It's talking about drunkenness. You know, so hatred. Now, we ought to hate sin, but not hate people, the sinner. So you see, we got to, we got to start to put these things in its proper place. And that is to be led by the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So understand, you know, walking in the Spirit, I mean, kind of look at it this way. You, get, you step out of your house and you walk to your car to go someplace. Or you walk to the store. Or you walk here or you walk there. Well, you got a destination in your, in your head that you're going someplace. Even if it's just for exercise. I'm going to go walk around this block a few times. You got a destination, you want to, you're doing it for health, or you're walking to the store to get some groceries, or you're walking to a friend's house to go fellowship, you know, or pick something up, on and on it goes, or you walk to the car to drive someplace. You have a destination in your mind, and when you get there, you're going to buy something, have fellowship, whatever it might be, you're going to reap the benefit of walking to that place. So to walk in the spirit, you have a thought in your mind that you want to go to heaven. And so you're on the road that gets you there. And the road that you get on is the road of life. And narrow is that road. And so there's a certain way that we are supposed to live. And here's the fruit of the spirit that, you know, we have this love. And love is the road you get on. Amen? You know, and... You know, if we live in the Spirit, we'll, we'll walk in the Spirit. You know, we got self-control is the road we get on. Gentleness is the road we get on. When I'm going to go walk, 
I want to walk in love and walk in kindness. Long-suffering, in other words, if somebody offends me or some, somebody's flesh bothers me, you know, I'm going to be long-suffering because I know that it's just flesh. And I know that the person, if he's born again or she's born again, you know, she has a gift of the Spirit. But she also, or he also has a flesh body that's carnal. And we're going to do things that are just ridiculous or, or dumb. And I have to have long-suffering with these people. I mean, Jesus is long-suffering with us, and we fail him all the time. You know, and we repent. But, you know, we say, how long, Lord, will I keep failing you in this thing? And the Lord loves us, and he's long-suffering. And he forbears with us. So this is the road we are on. It's a road of peace, a road of joy, a road of love and gentleness and kindness. This is the road we get on, and we walk in this. You know, to walk in something is to do it. So, you know, I mean, just because I discipline somebody or get angry about something doesn't mean I'm not walking in love. I think disciplining a child or a person is love. I mean, as a pastor, I'm supposed to rebuke and reprove and edify. Edify is to lift up. Reprove is to tell them they could have done better. And rebuke is to tell them, don't do that. You know, you, this is wrong. Stop. So people don't want to hear that nowadays. They want to just do whatever feels good to them, even if it's sin. Now, I might have to tell them, you know, hey, you're living in sin. You're living wrong. And you're not going to be blessed. And if you continue in sin, you're going to die and go to hell. So I have to tell people this. Well, some people have left the church because I've told them that. Because they might even have went out and said, Pastor Jim doesn't love. No, that is love. I mean, come on, man. If, if I see you getting ready to step off a cliff and die and fall to your death, and I don't tell you because I'm afraid you might think, oh, man, he doesn't love me because he's telling me something I want to do. <laughs> How ridiculous is that? I'm trying to keep you from going to hell, and so I'm going to tell you what you're doing. If you continue to go in that direction, you're going to wind up in hell. That's love. So we need to have that kind of love, as well as the kind of love that embraces and lifts up and so forth. Walking in the Spirit begins with us wanting to walk in the Spirit. I mean, come on, it's just a simple truth. If I want to walk to a certain place, I have to first get up and decide to do it. So, oh, I don't feel like walking, it's hot outside. Well, that's not walking, because now you're staying inside. So beginning to walk in the Spirit, it's not an easy walk. You know, I'm going to see that in just a second. You know, it's contrary to our flesh. Our flesh wants to be lazy. Our flesh wants to party. Our flesh wants to do all kind of things that is not holy and right. And, you know, some of it isn't, like, bad, but we'd much rather play a game than pray. We'd much rather go to a meeting that's involved in eating than to go to a prayer meeting where there's no food. You know, without, you know we'd rather eat than fast. You know, so everything that's walking in the Spirit is not easy. Some people offend you, so you just want to get mad and angry, and you just want to rebuke them, or you just want to get in their face about it. That's not love. That's because you're just trying to satisfy your flesh. You see what I'm saying? So walking in the Spirit begins with you deciding that you want to walk in the Spirit, and that is going to be a hard thing. You know, it's just like being on a diet. You make a decision, I'm going to lose weight, and so and then you're you start looking into what that means. Well, that means you can't eat all those pizzas. You can't eat all that bread. You can't eat all that stuff that's putting the weight on you. Oh, but I like to eat that. And then you got a choice. You see, you walk in the eating or you walk in the diet. You see, you, <laughs> that's so easy to me. That, I don't know why that would be hard for somebody to comprehend. Romans 8 1 through 17. Now, I'm going to break this down. I'm going to take it kind of piece by piece and give you a little insight to each part. don't want to take too long. It'll be a long message. Uh, beginning in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. Now, condemnation is guilt. It's like going before a judge and being condemned. Somebody is out there like the devil, and he's trying to condemn you all the time for your failures. Now, because I stumble and fall doesn't mean I'm walking in sin. It just means that I had a, <laughs> I had a bad day and, and the, my weakness of my flesh, and then, I, yes, I yield it to some kind of sin. But there's no condemnation. In other words, just because I stumble and fall 
doesn't make me a sinner or an evil person. I'm still trying to walk in the Spirit. So immediately upon failing, I immediately repent. I immediately say, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I feel so bad about this, and I should be stronger. You know, but there's those weak times that come over us. That's part of our flesh. And then because we're weak, we don't want to say no to that sin, and we let it happen. But then comes the guilt. The devil comes with condemnation. Holy Spirit comes with conviction. So the conviction is bringing us to repentance. And repentance gets us washed in his blood again. And then that sin is taken away and nailed to the cross. And now we walk in, in forgiveness. We walk in liberty and freedom because of the Holy Spirit's power. But condemnation is of the devil. And when you can't walk in that, you know, if you fail, the devil comes with it. You, sh you repent and shake that off. And you just remind him, devil, I'm forgiven in Jesus' name. But if you don't repent, then you're going to wind up walking in condemnation and the guilt of it. And then you're going to shake it off. And eventually you shake off sin too much and, quit and don't repent. You're going to wind up just walking in the sin continuously. You know, so we need to walk in the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. To sum this up real quick, Jesus came as a human being. You say, yeah, but he was God too. You say, you're absolutely right. But we see in Scripture that he left his glory in heaven. He left his power in his own authority. He left it all in heaven. And now he had to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, when he was in the wilderness and was tempted three times, he was victorious over the devil. My question to you would be, could he have failed? Well, why tempt him if he couldn't fail? The Bible says he was tempted and tested like unto all men, and he sinned not. So if he couldn't fall, then why even bother tempting him and testing him? That don't make any sense. So being a human being, just like Adam was a perfect human being before he failed, and when he got tested and tempted, he failed, and he ate of the fruit that he knew better. The Bible says Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't. Adam, Adam knew exactly what he was doing when he rebelled against God. But he was perfect. He did not have a sin nature like we have nowadays. So he should have said no. Jesus did not have a sin nature. His father was God. It's transmitted. Sin, it's the sin nature is transmitted from the father, not from the mother. And so he had the nature of God, his father, just like Adam had the nature of God. Created perfect. He was a son of God. Jesus was the son of God. He is God himself. But he left his deity in heaven. So now he came to live as a perfect man. He was trying to show us what Adam could have done and what we can do with the Holy Spirit. We can say no to sin, but our flesh is weak at times. But the Holy Spirit is in us to help empower us to live like Christ lived. That's a hard thing at times. I understand that. But we have to want to live holy. We have to want to live righteous. So Jesus came and he fulfilled, you see, that he fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law. In other words, he didn't sin. And so that's the righteous requirement of the law, that you sin not. That it was a day of atonement, there was the Passover lamb, there was everything that's in place to help to forgive a person to be able to walk upright. But he fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law so that we don't have to walk according to the flesh. We walk according to the Spirit. When I walk according to the Spirit, I receive everything that he has done for me. I become righteous even though I stumble and fall. But I become righteous because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, God has made me righteous. I'm in right standing with God. And so, because, because I walk uprightly before God by believing in His Son, when I do fail, immediately I'm convicted. When I'm walking in the Spirit, that means the Spirit is walking side by side. He's walking in me. And so, when I fail, He's right there to convict me of sin. 
And immediately I'm, I feel shameful and I repent. Some people don't feel shameful. They just do what they want to do. Well, they walk in the wrong direction when they do that. So I fulfill the righteous requirement of the law by believing in the one who has fulfilled the law. That's Jesus Christ. And so by believing on him, when I repent, he takes my sins out of the way. There's no judgment. No judgment. Because I stand righteous before the Lord. Because I've repented. That's it. But I don't repent like, you know, oh God, please forgive me. I mean, I repent. I'm grieved over it. I want to feel the grief for at least 24 hours, I'm just saying. I want to feel that. I don't want to just walk free from it because I want to have something to fall back on when I get tempted again. I remember how bad I felt. I don't want to feel that way. You know, I don't want to go through some type of spiritual sickness to keep myself straight, but I, will, I want to remember that I went through grief and sorrow and shame when I went through that sin. That way I will have more strength to say no next time. And that's what the love of God's all about. God loves us so much that he stays with us. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds to the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity or separation against God or the enemy towards God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Now, let's look at this for just a second. The mind of the flesh worries and it's fearful and it doubts. And when, and when, the, body, when the body gets sick, we start wondering, oh, am I going to die? Am I going to wind up in a hospital? How long will this last? How am I going to get over this thing? And we begin to ponder on it. But the mind of the spirit, when we, when we <clears throat> walk in the spirit, we, have the, we mind the things of the spirit. And the spirit reminds us that Jesus Christ got beat so we can be healed. He reminds us of he was in bondage on that cross. He was nailed so we can be free. He reminds us that he took a crown of thorns so we can have a sound mind. You see, the Holy Spirit begins to remind us of these things, and then we begin to walk in that truth. Understand? I'm walking towards that healing. I'm walking towards that sound mind. I'm walking towards that faith and not fear. I'm walking away from fear. I'm walking away from doubt. I'm walking away from confusion, and I'm walking to the benefits of the cross because I'm saved, and I know that I can come to the cross. And he's an ever-present help at the time of need. But it involves walking, spiritual walk. I can be laying on a bed, paralyzed, and still walk in the Spirit. I can walk to the things of God, the benefits, the promises of God. I can walk to them. You see, they're there for me, and a yes and amen, but I have to do something. You know, in the promised land, all the milk and honey that Jesus, that God promised them was inside wall cities. So they had to take the city in order to get the milk and honey. I need, to, I need to overcome my flesh and overcome my doubt and overcome my worry in order to get the things of God. Because if you doubt, you're not going to get it. You have to believe. Jesus said only believe. All things are possible. He didn't say only doubt. He said believe. We have to believe. We have to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. We need to walk towards that truth in the spirit. You need to embrace it. Bring it. Make it your own. Think these thoughts. As you walk in the spirit with God, that means that you're always going to be thinking about what spiritual things. If you're not reading your Bible, it's kind of hard then to think on spiritual things because you don't know what the Bible says. But the Bible is truth. The Bible is a written word of the spiritual word because Jesus is the word. It's his truth. He is for us. He's not against us. Let's walk to that truth. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. We, 
The way that we are born again is because the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and bears witness with us or reveals himself to us and we know he's there. He convicts us. He rebukes us. He reproves us. He does everything that a pastor is supposed to do in a church and he edifies us and lifts us up. He reminds us of things. He leads us to the truth of God's word in our minds. I don't have to have a Bible with me all the time, but I read my Bible so he can bring that truth back to me. And I might not be able to, um, to, re, to uh, memorize scriptures, but he brings the truth back about a scripture. And so we can, we, can, uh, we can think about that truth and understand that it's for us. You know, there's things in the scriptures that we just, we know as a Christian. I know that God is for me. He's not against me. I know he'll never leave me or forsake me. I know he loves me. I know that God loves me, gave his son for me. I know these basic truths. I might not be able to quote the scripture wholly and completely, but I do know that he will never leave me. You see? That's because I have walked to that truth. You see, I've walked in the spirit. And now the spirit reminds me of that truth over and over when I need it. So we need to get, we need to kind of, we have to get so much truth in us. The more truth you get in you, the more that the Holy Spirit can remind you of. How can he remind you of something that you don't know? So the first place he's got to bring you to is the truth. So when you're reading your word, he will illuminate that truth as, as you're reading the Bible. Not everything's going to make sense that, that day you're reading, but something's going to make sense. The Lord, the Lord, the Holy Spirit is going to manifest that truth to you. Then the next time you read, you'll get another truth. Or he might take that same truth and bring it about another way. But he's always reminding us of truth. That's what he is, the Holy Spirit, who guides us into all truth. But you have to walk with him. You have to walk in the Spirit. Because, you, you know, it's, you're walking with the Lord. He's right there with you. It's a walk as you get to heaven. You're walking to heaven. You're walking through this life to get to heaven. And understand... You see, you got to get your mind understanding what I mean by walk. If you go to college and you're learning to be an engineer, well, you got to stay faithful to all the courses. You got to go to college, you got to go through every semester, you got to take all the prescribed courses, then you get your graduation certificate, your scholarship, or whatever it is. So you walk through all the courses, and now you get the reward. You see, you're walking through school, through the classes, through all the studies. You went through all the tests. You're walking through them. You finish them. As you walk through them, they get finished. That's what walking in the Spirit's all about. You're walking in the Spirit who's guiding you, leading you to heaven. Don't you want to go to heaven? If you walk in the flesh, you're not going to get there. You walk in the Spirit, you'll get there because He's leading you there. Your flesh does not know how to get to heaven. All it knows how to do is, is participate in the things of this world. And you walk through this life, and you die, where will you go? Verse 10, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. So understand, when I got born again, my flesh died. And my spirit became alive. I began to know right from wrong. But my flesh, I let my flesh do some things that I, don't, that I shouldn't be doing. And then death comes. That's guilt, condemnation, and shame. So I repent, and then that's a righteous act. And then righteousness comes, and I revive. And I become alive again. Does that mean that if I sin and don't have time to repent that I'll go to hell? No. It just means that condemnation will come. But once I die, all my bad works will burn up if I have not walked away from Christ. As long as I stay in, the, in repenting and stay in the mode of walking with the Spirit, when I die, all my bad works are going to burn up in a fire in heaven. And all my good works I'm going to get a reward for. And then I, I go into heaven. But if I have no good works... Yet I still believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All my bad works will burn up and I'll still be able to be saved and go to heaven. 
You know, so it's not about how many good works you got over your bad works. It's about your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, as a Christian, I've said this a million times, you want to do good. And the reason I want to do good is because I'm a Christian. I don't do good works to get to heaven. I do good works because I'm a Christian. That's all part of walking in the Spirit. Loving people, being gentle and meek and long-suffering, all of this is part of walking in the Spirit. So we need that Spirit to raise us from the dead. That's what it said. If that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in us, it will quicken our mortal bodies. That's our physical bodies. To make our physical bodies do what is right. So the Spirit's in me to raise me from dead works or dead flesh and sin to being alive in Christ, doing good works, that the world might see my good works and glorify God. So I'd want to do good works because the Spirit of the Lord is in me, and I love doing good works now. So when I do bad works or do something that's wrong, it bothers me. It might bother me for days that I said or did something wrong. Why? Because I don't want to walk that walk no more. I want to walk in the Lord. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For, we, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put on death, <clears throat> let me say that again, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I was pausing, I was thinking about we are debtors, okay? Brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. So I'm a debtor. In other words, I owe a debt. It's been paid. Jesus Christ paid it all. But my life in him now is literally paying that debt. Not that I owe anything. It's, he's already paid it. But I'm living for him. That's the point. I'm in debt to the Lord. When somebody takes care of something and he, they pay a debt you have and so forth, aren't you thankful? I mean, if you've seen that person on the street, would you ignore them? Or would you go over, shake their hand, and say, how you doing? And just be, you know, just be real friendly because, hey, they paid a debt. Well, my Lord paid a debt, and so when I, I see him every day, and I worship him, and I give him praise because he paid the debt. Now I can go to heaven. You see? So now, when I read this, that's what I see. I'm not a debtor to the flesh, which means I would go to hell. But I, my debt's been paid, so I don't owe anything. But my, my body now that has been raised into life is wanting to serve him because of what he's done for me. Amen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. So the idea is that we're going to suffer in this life. Everybody's not happy that I became a Christian. They talk bad about me out there, the unsaved. My family made fun of me until they finally got saved. And they said horrible things. So we suffer in this life because we come to Christ. People out there that don't believe in the Lord and they don't want to follow him, they look at you that follow the Lord as just something like an alien, like you're deformed. Something's wrong with you. Your brains are messed up. You don't want to have the so-called fun of this world anymore because you're having fun in the Lord that they don't understand and you're having peace and joy in the Lord. You don't need this world. We participate and go on vacations and stuff, but even when I go on vacation, I'm looking around at people and praying for them. We took our two grandchildren out to this little, this little fun place, and they were having all kind of fun. There was a lot of children there. And I'm sitting watching my grandchildren, but I also was praying for all the children. I mean, I'm just sitting there on this chair, and I'm praying, Lord, in Jesus' name, protect these children from molesters. Keep them safe. Let them know you, Lord. I pray that, that Lord, your Holy Spirit would move upon them and touch them and, br and make yourself known to them. So I'm having a good time watching my grandkids. I ate some pizza, drank a drink, you know, and, and I enjoyed that, that, them having fun. Man, that I, I gave me fun and joy inside of me. But I was also praying. I was aware of the people that was around me. 
I was praying for their parents. I was praying for everyone in the place. Everywhere I go, the grocery store, the bank, I'm very much aware of everybody around me. And I pray for them. Because that's what I do. That's what we, prayer is our language. When I'm praying for people, I'm talking to God. And he understands that language. Because he gave us that language. It's a language of love. God, Jesus prayed all the time. He's interceding for us right now. You see, I understand his language because I speak it. Prayer. That's what this is all about. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're suffering on this life. We still get sick. We're aging and all that stuff in the flesh. But our spirit is perfect. Our spirit is living inside this, this body, that's, this house, this tent. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, and I'm glorifying God in it. One day I'm going to die. Man, I want to make every day count. I haven't made a lot of days count since I've been saved. And I, I say that in shame and guilt. But, I'm, but I made my mind up. I'm going to make every day count. I'm going to wake up in the morning and worship. And then start paying attention to the people around me as I'm driving. As I pass schools and hospitals and businesses and pray. I say, man, I can't remember. I keep doing that. I'm too busy. I'm busy too. But it's my language. I speak English to people which is no problem to be working or busy and still be talking and communicating. So I can be working and busy and still be communicating with God in prayer. Be aware of the people around us. God has given us free will to choose life or death. That's an easy one. How many of y'all want to choose death? No, everybody wants to choose life. But what does that mean? Here in Deuteronomy 30 is, is God through Moses, wrote down to the, to the people of Israel. He said, today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and, cursings, and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make, all that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Isn't that something? You know, as I read this, I know that it's an Old Testament scripture, but in Hebrews 12 it talks about we're covered by a cloud of witnesses angels and people that are up in heaven already. And so he's, he's bringing, he told Israel that he's uh, making heaven and earth, call on heaven and earth to witness. So we're already in the New Testament, we're told we have a witness that's watching everything. Those angels and all have heard you give your life to the Lord. And when you begin to drift and do things that are wrong, those angels come and they speak to you and the Holy Spirit speaks to you to turn from that way. God himself speaks to you. You know, but he's telling you you have a choice. We have a free will. If you have a Calvinistic review, you know, um, have a view about life, a Calvinistic view of life, then you know what I'm saying if you're Calvinist. You just don't ignore what I'm saying about free will. My God is not an evil God, so he does not make me do evil. That's what James 1 said. That when we do evil, it's because we, we have been <laughs> tempted in our own lust. And then we fail and go sin. The God himself did not make us sin. We use our free will to sin. As well as our free will to choose life. So then down here it says, so that you and your descendants might live. Now, if you're an evil person, whether you directly train up your kids or not, they're watching you and they're going to be trained up in your evil and wickedness. They're going to sound just like you because they're listening to you. Where, what else are they going to listen to? They're listening to the television. They're going to sound like the, the cartoons and things that they watch. They're going to sound like the, the friends they hang out with at school. So you're training them up. If you train them up in life, then they're going to have life in them. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart. Well, he will be able to depart. It doesn't really mean that he won't, but it means he'll have a hard time because he'll be convicted. By the life you live, the Holy Spirit will be bringing that back to him. When, when he's being tempted to do bad, he knows where you stand. That child knows where that parent stands. And they already know that if they do this that's wrong, they have to answer to that parent or that grandparent. And not so much answer, but they'll feel so bad when they come into that person's presence. When we stand before the Lord, how do you think we're going to be? We're all going to be crying and he's going to wipe away our tears, but at least I'm going to go to heaven. I'd rather cry and get in heaven than cry and wind up in hell. 
It is our choice whether we walk in the flesh or we walk in the spirit. I said that before. It's our choice. Life and death's our choice. Make a choice to walk in the spirit. Galatians 6, 6 through 8 says, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. This is one of my most favorite scriptures. This is the one I keep in my mind all the time. When I'm out just, just going through life and I get tempted to sin, I just remember that I'm going to bear some fruit. I'm going to, what I sow is going to come up in my life. And it's not going to be corruption to go to hell, but it's going to be corruption of, I'm going to feel guilt and shame. And maybe if it's the person that I sin against, that person's going to be mad. That person might even hate me. I might cause that person to hate me. And then that person might wind up dying and going to hell because I did something to cause that person to hate me. So I ask them to forgive me. Then they, then they have to deal with it themselves. But I don't want to be the cause that somebody goes to hell. I'd rather take the blame than let somebody go to hell over what they think I did or said. I try my best. I can't... I can't write every mistake, but I pray that the Holy Spirit will write it for me as I repent of it and I begin to understand and try to sow good seed. When I pray and ask the Holy Spirit to touch those lives, because I can't, I can't get to them. I don't even know where they live, some of them. Well, because I'm praying that, that's good seed. And, that, and the Holy Spirit then will go and speak to them. It's amazing what God will do. But you got to sow good seed. Good seed is repenting. Good seed is, is caring about somebody you might have hurt. Re just forgiving. Forgiving somebody. Walking in holiness. Walking in righteousness by forgiving and loving and caring. That's sowing good seed. What we say and how we say it reveal whether we are walking in the spirit or not. You know that there's a right motive and a right way to say something. My wife corrects me all the time because it comes out like I don't really mean it. But, you know, I'm, I'm angry at that time. I'm sorry, and you just say it with anger. No, you're not. The motive is telling me I'm not walking in the spirit, I'm walking in the flesh. And I can read right through that kind of stuff. In James 1 it says, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, because you're deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. So if you're just a hearer only, if you listen to this video but you don't want to apply it, you're just like a person that's looking, you looked at yourself in the mirror, you walked away, and you forgot what you looked like. You know, you forgot to fix your hair, and then somebody tells you, your hair's all messed up. <sighs> you forgot. So now you look ridiculous. Who cares if your hair's messed up? But well, you know what I'm talking about. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. People talk about religion because they don't understand. I don't like that word, religion. But the Bible uses it, as you can see here in James, in the New King James Bible. And it make, it's making reference to a re religion is something that we follow, something that we believe in. But... If any of you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue. In other words, he's saying, if you really are a follower of Jesus and your religion is to follow Jesus, then you're going to watch what you're saying and you're going to watch how you're saying it. So the tongue is very important. I'm not going to preach on the tongue right now. But the tongue, is James is talking about the tongue, and James 3 is all about the tongue, is telling us that our tongue is guiding our life. 
So if you're harsh with someone because you're mad at them or to aggravate you, people pick that up and the direction you're going in is to eventually maybe wreck your relationship with that person. You understand what I'm saying? But if we calm down before we speak and let the spirit speak through us, then we save that relationship. I have messed up relationships. I'm a, I blame being an Italian. You know, I'm hot-headed. I, I've been angry most of my life. Boy, that's been a battle for me to bring that anger under control by the help of the Holy Spirit so that when I speak, people will hear love come from me instead of that carnal self. You know, they'll, they'll get away. They'll push away. They don't want to come around me. You know, even my own children, you know, I have hurt them by the way I have said things. And I love my children, you know, more than anything. My wife first, then my children. Jesus first, of course. Jesus, my wife, and my kids, my grandkids. And I love them so much, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt my wife. You know, I make my own laws up because I love my wife. So I'll pay attention to what she doesn't like, and I try to live by it. You know, I mean, I try my best. I fail often. And then I have to say I'm sorry. But my sorry has to be real. When I open my mouth and say I'm sorry, it has to be real or she'll just push it off. Same way with God. He knows when you're telling the truth if you're sorry or not. So we need to be sorry with godly sorrow. A broken and a contrite spirit, God will not despise. That's in Psalms 52 or 51. Read them both, they're good. But anyway, this one's religion is useless. Your religion is useless if you're following flesh into some religious things. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. So I don't want my life to be filthy rags. I want it to be nice, clean rags so I can help to nurture somebody with those rags, so to speak. Anyway, I want to wrap up. Let's finish this message out. I want to ask you a question. Do you want to walk in the Spirit? Easy question. I'm sure everybody that made it to the end of this video is saying, yes, I want to walk in the Spirit. That's good. But like I said, when you say yes, or you're saying it with the right motive in mind, or you're just trying to walk in the Spirit to gain things in life. Because I want to tell you something right now. When you start walking in the Spirit, even those people that are Christians that are not walking in the Spirit are going to be in, on your case. Even Christians will tell you you're going too far. So be careful and be ready and know what you're saying. Yes, I want to walk in the Spirit. I know what it means. All who will live godly and walk in the Spirit will be persecuted. So let me pray a prayer with you then. If you said yes to that, then I want to pray with you and agree with you right now. You need all the agreement you can get. I need agreement by, from ministers that already went to heaven because they were agreeing with me to walk in the Spirit before they went to heaven. And now I'm praying for you right now. Father, in Jesus' name, everyone who watched this and they said, yes, I want to walk in the Spirit, I pray their motives is right. I pray that they said it with the right motives coming out of their mouth, out of their heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I come into agreement with them and stand with them right now that they are meaning what they mean, and you know it, and I agree that they will be able to walk in the Spirit to please you. And they'll be blessed, and that's not what they're seeking, but they will be blessed because they're walking in the Spirit to please you. So I lift them up to you this day and pray that blessing and that strength upon them in Jesus' name. Amen.